Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Barry Rabe. I'm a professor here at the Ford School, and I'm the director of Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, one of the research centers here at the school. Uh, I want to begin by thanking our co-sponsors for this event, the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, the Urban and Regional Planning Program, the Detroit School Series, and the Residential College. As we both reflect on the topic, the city after abandonment, but also celebrate the publication of this book by the same title, and welcome the two co-editors, as well as authors of some of the important chapters, uh, Margie Dewar and June Manning Thomas. Um, this is an incredibly salient question for us to be thinking about in southeastern Michigan, but for urban areas throughout the Midwest and really throughout many parts of North America, this entire question of transitioning large cities as they go through different stages. And one of the things that I find really intriguing about this book, in addition to just the richness of the chapters, it divides this topic into three large sections. One, what does the city become after abandonment? Two, what makes a difference in what cities become after abandonment? And three, I think the most interesting topic of all, what should the city become after abandonment? Um, what we will be doing today is touching probably on each of those three areas to different degree. I want to begin by inviting both Margie and June up to offer some comments, remarks, reflections on the book. We're also absolutely delighted to be joined today by John Gallagher from the Detroit Free Press, who has written extensively on this issue, particularly as it affects the city of Detroit, and even within recent weeks, uh, front page stories about Detroit and its evolution and land transition issues uh, at, a, at a very, very significant point. So we are pleased yet again to have John involved in a close-up event, and he will follow Margie and June with offering reflection of his own. We will then move to uh, audience Q&A, so hopefully, despite this large audience, which we welcome, uh, there'll be opportunity for discussion. Would only note finally then that once we conclude, there will be a reception out in the Great Hall and indeed a book purchasing opportunity along with a book signing event. Uh, so there's much, much uh, to, to be excited about here, but let me begin by welcoming Marky Dewar. Marky, welcome. Thank you, Barry, and thank you to Close Up for inviting June and me to, to talk about our book. You know, if, if any of you have written books, you know this is the most fun thing that one can do, have the book done, but then get to talk a lot about it. So um, why did we do this project? Now let me see if I can. Many central cities of the Northeast and the Midwest have lost substantial shares of their peak population since 1950. And initially they declined after World War II because manufacturing firms, changes in manufacturing technology meant that manufacturing was more efficient in large suburban sites rather than old multi-story um, central city sites with railroad access. And um, the housing post-World War II housing boom meant that many people moved from the central cities into the suburbs, mainly white people because of um, extreme restrictions on the movement of African Americans into white neighborhoods and restrictions on mortgage availability for African American homeowners. In addition, retail moved out of the city. People no longer shopped downtown. They shopped in, um, used their autos to get to stores and they shopped in increasingly in malls. So the, all this led to the urban crisis of the 1970s with severely abandoned neighborhoods. But this was a neighborhood problem. So the South Bronx was shocking, um, but there were neighborhoods in Camden, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, and Baltimore, Detroit, Chicago that were also very um, disinvested. Then the decline continued, and it um, was accelerated, or in some cities, the decline stopped because of restructuring of the economy. So Chicago and New York City, for instance, reinvented, were reinvented uh, based on producer services instead of manufacturing. 
But cities like Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, I could name, keep naming them, it's a long list, didn't find ways or did that didn't happen to them. And so their population decline continued. And until really um, by the late 1990s and the early 2000s, it was clear this was not a neighborhood issue. This was a city issue. This was an issue about rethinking what should cities could and should cities become. How could we reinvent um, large areas of fairly vacant land? How could we assure quality of life for people who remained, who were increasingly low income and increasing and more, more and more increasingly minority race? So that was the issue that prompted us to think about this book. Because as we were thinking about these issues in the early 2000s, we did not find people who had already written about it. And it seemed as if in policy and in um, city planning, most of the emphasis was still on growth and still on bringing in stadiums and convention centers and casinos and any big plant that might suggest it would come with subsidized and so forth. So urban planners traditionally, their job is guide, manage, encourage growth. But that didn't seem to be the issue that most any of these cities were facing. So what should we do? And this map shows, you can see the cluster of the very, the white area across the northeast and midwest of the United States are cities that lost large amount of their populations from 1950 to 2000. Um, you can see how many there are and how much they have in the cluster. So therefore, as Barry said, we set out to answer three questions. What does a city become after abandonment? And we were most interested in what was going on in the vast disinvested neighborhoods. How were the residents remaking the places where they lived? How were people coming in and remaking the city? What were community-based organizations doing? What had made their efforts possible? And so that was one question. Second one was, what makes a difference in what such cities become? We saw that different cities with the same indicators of low market demand for land and the same losses of population were having different experiences. And as planners, we're always looking for what are the levers that one can use to bring about better outcomes in the same market conditions. And so we were intrigued by that question, looking at um, political relationships, social relationships, policies, laws, regulations, and so forth. And then the third question is, what should a city become after abandonment? As planners, we're supposed to, that's our job. We're supposed to envision what's the future of cities and figure out how to get from here to that vision of a better city. So we set out to organize our book around these three questions. And we found, started looking for authors. We looked, in, looked at lo the abstracts from loads of conferences that um, like geography, planning, public policy, urban affairs, and so forth. And we didn't find people doing this work. And so we, um, thanks to, and this is where Close Up really came in. Close Up enabled us to reach out to people who were doing research on issues that might be related, who hadn't thought about their issues, their topics, in the way we suggested. So for instance, we found people studying New Orleans disaster. And we said, New Orleans was losing a huge amount of its population before the hurricane. How about thinking about this as a city after abandonment in a different way? And they started doing so. So we had a wonderful symposium, thanks to um, close up that uh, where we critiqued each other's papers and we aren't tried to reorient our thinking it was so exciting that I really um, I was so high on ideas I couldn't really sleep for three days it was so fun <laughs> so um, so what did we come up with so what does the city become after abandonment and throughout this talk what we're going to do is mainly use Detroit examples in the book there are many other cities mentioned and discussed, but we're 
because we're closest to Detroit, we're going to just mainly talk about that. So first, as you've no, all, no doubt heard, community gardens are a major topic in thinking about what cities are becoming. So um, Laura Lawson and Abilene Miller estimated there were 875 gardens in Detroit thanks to information from the community, the Garden Resource Collaborative. I actually think there are probably more, but they're impossible to count because um, of the institutional arrangements that are difficult. Just to give one example of these institutional difficulties. Uh, <laughs> yes, right. A technical difficulty, not a, not a, <laughs> I hope. Anyway, um, so uh, these gardens in Detroit are, um, may or may not be on land owned by the um, gardeners. And so they're, and they have not acquired or rented the land in part because it is so difficult to do so and often expensive. So what, how could institutions, really the question is how can institutions be established so that people's F, huge amount of investment and effort in making gardens, such gardens in these in disinvested areas, how can those be reinforced so that the people who want to garden don't lose their prop, their investment when other people want the land. So another, um, uh, other people who are remaking the cities that you've no doubt heard about are artists. And Andrew Hersher looked at um, what was the relationship between art and the neighborhoods around them, the art, and what was the relationship between the artists and the neighbors. And he concluded that critique, urban critique, um, can't coexist, may not be able to coexist, at least does not coexist in Detroit with um, collaborative art efforts. So efforts that where neighbors and artists work together to use art to strengthen neighborhoods lose the critique aspects of art. So for instance, in the case of um, the upper left, um, see if this works. Uh, in this case, that's uh, Motor City Blightbusters Chaz Miller Butterfly, and uh, this is the powerhouse. These were collaborative efforts that were they did work with neighbors, but Heidelberg Project and Object Orange have been largely um, often antagon. Uh, the neighbors have been antagonistic about what those groups have been doing, and um, so, and done without any consultation with people who lived in the area. Community-based organizations also have tried to um, remake the city. And Lan Dung, who's right, one of the chapter authors, put your, name, your hand up, uh, is um, looked at the effects of the low-income housing tax credit program on Detroit neighborhoods. The federal, that's a federal program whose major aim is to increase the supply of affordable housing in, in the country. In, area, in cities like Detroit, there's a huge supply of affordable housing, or what HUD would define as affordable housing. But it, um, the program gets used in such places to strengthen neighborhoods. And so did it. All over the city, there community development organizations working on using this program, or did they did this before the uh, recession undermined all housing um, development. But so did it work? And what Land found was that the strengthening of neighborhood housing markets only happened where the low-income housing tax credit projects were accompanied by a lot of other projects as well, a lot of other efforts to strengthen neighborhoods or strengthen areas. So in this case, it was um, this area where there were a lot of low-income housing tax credit projects and a lot of other efforts. That's Midtown. Here, Elmwood, Lafayette Park, and urban renewal areas since the 1950s. And here, uh, Jefferson Chalmers or Creekside, where um, also there have been loads of efforts. So you can see, though, from the dots that 
there were low-income housing tax credit projects scattered throughout the city. So what this shows really is that having the clusters of them is more effective in actually achieving neighborhood strengthening. So second question, what makes a difference? Why are outcomes different in different situations? We looked at two issues of, that concerned um, what is it that a city government can or should do, or a city government can do? What is the capacity of government to make changes in the future of the city that's declined so much? Youngstown's a great example of a, is the, was for a long time the only city that had adopted a plan that said we accept we're going to be smaller. We are smaller and we're probably going to be smaller in the future. And so how did that happen when no other cities facing similar situations had been able to? So an author named Laura Schatz looked at how a governance, a governance coalition emerged, made up of a new generation of city officials, some Youngstown State University leaders. Youngstown State's now one of the two biggest industries in the city and city council members. They wanted to identify directions for more positive change and they created a very community engaged process, remarkably so. It won a national award for its partic citizen participation from the American Planning Association. The private sector business community was absent and be in, in large part because that is Youngstown's situation. It's private sector has largely disappeared. So is that what kind of the kind of coalition that's necessary to rethink direction or can this be replicable, this effort be replica, replicable elsewhere? And I think we'll see that with the, what the fortunes of Detroit Future City, the plan that came out a couple weeks ago in Detroit, which has not been adopted as the city's plan but that is a decline or a, a, a plan that accepts that decline has happened. And then sec, a second look at um, governance issues um, or governing issues was by Dale Thompson, who's, raise your hand, who's, um, who um, looked at how, can t how has targeting of resources happened in cities. As you can see from this map, targeting in Detroit hasn't meant really targeting or focusing. It's really the target zones have covered nearly the entire city. But a lot, a fairly a moderate amount of evaluation research has shown that targeting resources, focusing more resources in certain kinds of areas than others, does lead to um, positive effects on those neighborhoods because, especially if they're sort of, the sort of neighborhoods that are not the worst off, but are, um, kind of experiencing blight and uh, what Dale called middle neighborhoods. And the reason they do, that the investment has such an effect is that it, it restores neighbors, neighbors' confidence and makes them reinvest in their property. So um, Dale looked at Baltimore, Cleveland, and Detroit and pointed to the huge political difficulties in choosing to focus substantial resources on certain neighborhoods that weren't the most needy. And the weak institutional structure in a place like Detroit, where the CDC sector, for the community development corporation sector, for instance, is not terribly strong, and where rules governing the use of different funds um, really make it um, forbid certain kinds of uh, targeting. So with that, I'll turn this over to June. Say something further. Oops. Good afternoon, everyone. I see one of my oldest colleagues from Michigan State, um, a colleague of. Um, old, well, he's oldest, one of the oldest. <laughs> so please, John, please come. Okay. 
So this is John Schweitzer, and thanks to MSU people who came. So um, I'd like to pick up. Uh, we're still looking at this whole issue of uh, what makes a difference. And so um, as Marky was saying, Dale Thompson's uh, chapter looked at what make to, makes a difference in terms of citywide targeting, but we also wanted to know what makes a difference in terms of what happens with CDCs, because CDCs are the ones that are quite often using the low-income housing tax credits and using the other funds to um, essentially make decisions. So um, my chapter for the book looked um, at a case study of three CDCs, and they're pictured up here. Um, the one on the far um, left, let's see, which is, sorry. Well, where is the red? See, we should have had a little tutorial. I'm so sorry. Right. Next time we will have a tutorial for ourselves. <laughs> but uh, this one is um, uh, NDND, which is the Brightmore neighborhood. There's another one, which is the U Snapback uh, neighborhood, and then there is Jefferson Chalmers. And we were looking at why are certain kinds of decisions made that seem to be counterproductive in terms of trying to make a visible difference in um, city neighborhoods. And in this particular case, uh, what you see there is the pattern that that CDC, the, the one Brightmore in D&D, &D, chose to construct housing for its particular neighborhood. Um, they constructed over 300 units, and yet it was um, apparently somewhat uh, modified dispersion in terms of its pattern. And, and quite frankly, if you drove down the street, you were likely to see two or three vacant lots and then um, a burned out house and then a boarded up house and then a brand new house that they had constructed and then another few vacant lots. And so this particular chapter was looking at why, why this outcome? Why are they essentially apparently um, building housing in a way that doesn't seem to make a difference for a neighborhood? In that particular case, um, what we found was that there were very good reasons. One was the market was essentially disappearing from under their efforts. And so as they tried to build, more and more units were being abandoned. That's one problem. Uh, another problem was the nature of um, the organization. So sometimes the organization was not able to uh, essentially function in a way that would allow it to make the decisions that would give critical mass to its efforts. Um, and in some cases, it was a matter of policy. So one of the policies, for example, for the city of Detroit was um, that you essentially, because of the zoning ordinance, you had to have a certain lot width. Um, you couldn't use the old 25 uh, uh, foot lot width. You had to have a larger lot. And so these organizations, in order to assemble appropriate land, were acquiring something like 130 lots in order to build 50 houses. So they were moving around from place to place to try to find enough land um, to build um, that amount of housing. So we found um, <coughs> examples like that that were showing that it wasn't just that, um, that CDCs didn't understand targeting or didn't understand the need for critical mass, but that there were some institutional barriers that were keeping them from doing so. Um, in contrast, um, one of the other organizations, you Snapback, had favorable demographic um, um, attributes. So that, for example, it had a mostly vacant portion of its area that it could use to amass uh, housing. Um, and so the effects of that were that um, mayors would drive people through the you Snapback area showing this is a successful project because it seems to be all amassed whereas really it was partially a result of the environmental circumstances. So uh, what makes a difference? Um, so as she mentioned, we looked at other cities as well. So um, one of them was New Orleans. And here was a situation where you would think in such a clear case of abandonment that this would be um, an effort to really see a city come together. Uh, not just in terms of its own efforts, the city government, but also with CDCs. And of course, many of you have seen 
uh, news reel of essentially lots of people coming in with resources. Uh, well, there was actually enough of a problem that we had two chapters on just what went wrong with efforts to rebuild New Orleans. Uh, this slide is um, mainly from one of the chapters. It's the one that re refers to the CDC efforts. Uh, but um, in this case, this was Jeffrey Lowell and Lisa Bates. Um, and what they did was to look at what had happened that had essentially uh, cut out a lot of the local CDCs from the reconstruction process for uh, New Orleans. And um, what they did was to kind of analyze what had gone wrong with this effort to try to get indigenous community-based grassroots organ organizations involved in the process. And what they discovered was that even before Katrina had hit, the community development system was so weak that by the time the hurricane hit, um, they already had something like 10,000 vacant housing units and they had um, CDCs or community development corporations that were building something like two houses a year. So they were already fairly weak, nascent organizations. And, and um, not only that, but resources for those organizations had gradually been taken away year by year. So they were even in worse shape in 2005 than they had been in 2000. So um, then what happened, very interesting story these authors weave of, um, again, this big crisis of Katrina, um, this, great, this great debate in terms of should we rebuild um, all of the city? Of course, the low-lying areas were the areas where um, the poorest people lived, um, racial minorities lived. Um, the higher areas were the areas the, the uh, middle class and the elite lived. And sure enough, the first plans that were coming out were suggesting that you rebuild in the higher areas. This caused a lot of difficulties. So they weave a story of what was going on with this debate. And what they suggest is that the CDCs were essentially outflanked by other organizations that came into New Orleans that um, were, um, had more visibility, more appeal. I almost said sex appeal. It was sex appeal. One of them was by Brad Pitt. Uh, so <laughs> essentially this idea that these high profile organizations were coming in and they got a lot of the resources, the foundations were channeling money to them and the indigenous organizations that had been there all along struggling just could not get off the ground. So um, that's a very interesting story of um, essentially what happened to that particular initiative. Uh, we also have a fascinating story in terms of what happened in Detroit. This particular chapter was written by Marty Dewar. Um, and what she did was to compare um, just the way that we look at vacant property and why there's a difference between um, the usage of vacant property in Detroit compared to Cleveland. Cleveland happens to be a very good comparison for Detroit for a number of reasons, one of which is that both have lost population um, between 40 and 60 percent over the past 60 years. Both are Midwest, mo both are post-industrial, but they're very different terrains. And her chapter gives a, a really um, debilitating critique of what had gone on in Detroit in comparison. It's actually kind of, of it, it makes you a little sad to read this chapter, but um, you should read it anyway. But um, it's, really, it's, it's really amazing <laughs> because um, she found different cultures and different institutional capacity between these two cities. And in Detroit, um, for example, the city government really did not play as strong a role in supporting the community development corporations or the CDCs. And in part, that was because of the way city government was structured. Um, at that time, Cleveland had had a ward-based system for some time. Um, uh, Detroit, as many of you know, um, only recently adopted a ward-based system that's um, going to be put in place with the next election. So there really was no um, sense of ownership by the council members for um, any particular neighborhoods. Uh, the mayors had very different um, uh, concerns in terms of whether or not they saw um, the development of community development as um, an important kind of initiative. 
Um, so that was one problem. Then you had all, um, institutions that had existed for some time in Cleveland, such as NPI, Neighborhood Progress, um, which had uh, essentially ch uh, channeled a lot of foundation money to community development in that city. And working relationships, it's actually quite cozy in, in Cleveland. Um, the uh, people who work for community development organizations and people for, uh, who work for the city, um, they um, socialize, they exchange jobs, they marry each other. I mean, it's really very, very nice. Um, that's not the that, that's not in her chapter, but I happen to know that. <laughs> it's very different in Detroit. Um, no one accuses the um, community development community and the mayor's office in Detroit of being cozy. So, so what should cities become after abandonment? This was the last portion of our chapter, really. A lot of fun to read just different ideas about what people were thinking should happen. This was, of course, uh, this draft was written before, um, as Margie mentioned, the, uh, the recent plan was issued, but we were already beginning to see some of the trends that needed to be encouraged um, at that time. So what should city be, cities become? One is they should become strategic about vacancy. We have a magnificent chapter by uh, Robert Beauregard, um, who um, really gives critical thought to this whole idea of um, addressing vacant property through campaigns. Uh, there was at one point um, a national um, vacant property campaign, which has since been absorbed into the Center for Community Progress, which had a certain approach to the vacancy that you see in different cities around the country and the world. And they had a series of steps that they suggested you should undertake. And a lot of it, of course, built on the efforts of um, uh, um, Genesee County, the Flint um, Initiative, and some of the efforts in Youngstown. And what Beauregard's chapter did was really offer a bigger view of what we should be thinking about. His idea is that we need to be sure that we don't focus so much on land and on um, vacancy and on how to redevelop that we forget that there are still a lot of social needs and social issues that have to be dealt with. A lot of times, unfortunately, people, when they start talking about uh, vacancy and redevelopment, they forget that there are people involved here. So he was saying, well, you really need to be sure that you look at social initiatives and not just um, land development initiatives. Um, he also suggested that you needed to understand that local politics play a role. We certainly have seen that. Um, that you can't just decide you're going to clear out a certain neighborhood because it's mostly vacant. We discovered that in Detroit. Um, that there are people that will still live there that will oppose that kind of initiative. And that was foreseen by Beauregard um, in his thinking exercise about how should we think about these cities. Uh, what else should cities become? We have another pair of authors. Um, who essentially suggested that they should plan for sustainability. That just because they have vacancy and abandonment doesn't mean that they shouldn't attend to issues such as sustainability. Um, so um, the authors of this particular chapter looked at plans for sustainability by picking out those cities which had um, signed on as, um, as part of an environmental initiative or had created some sort of sustainability plan and picked out four of those cities and did a very nice content analysis of what were these cities that had lost population, what were they thinking about in terms of sustainability. Um, one of the conclusions of this particular chapter was that they were doing a great job in terms of thinking about environmental sustainability and business and economic development, but um, somewhat of a less successful job in terms of thinking about social equity. Um, which is unfortunate because those are the cities, of course, where social equity is still a major dilemma. Uh, what should cities become? We also have a chapter by Brent Ryan, who is a, um, a designer, urban designer, um, and um, is at MIT, and has also published another book, um, Design After Decline, that um, kind of is a bigger version. If you don't want to buy that whole book, then you can read this chapter because it summarizes <laughs> that whole book. 
But um, essentially what he looked at was, okay, so what do we need in terms of design? What are some of the design, the ways we should think about urban design? And what he suggested was um, one way we should think about it is to think about consolidation. So this, uh, this particular image on the left is sort of, he claims that this is not Detroit, but look at that. I mean, really, I mean, it's sort of like, really? You know, but anyway, so he says it's a generic city, but you know, so anyway. So here you see on the left is typically what happens is you have this dense por a portion in the middle, and then you have these other little developments that are popping up, many of them by nonprofits. And what he's saying is that we need a bigger picture where we begin to develop in a way that consolidates um, that all the institutions and all of the nonprofits come together and figure out um, um, techniques for consolidation, which is a little bit of a forewarning, again, of what um, Detroit Future City is saying in terms of investment. And then what should cities become in terms of lessons that we've learned this far? The last chapter um, is a, a really quite extraordinary, um, it's combination interview um, uh, uh, reflection by people that have worked that have worked in practice um, in uh, Youngstown and uh, Flint, uh, talking with Margie Dewar, and um, the three of them are the authors of the chapter, and they've come up with um, what did we learn from Youngstown, what did we learn from Flint, and I thought the lessons for that were so good that I actually listed them, um, and uh, basically. And of course, that picture is not Youngstown or Flint. I thought that's a really cool picture of Dave Bing. <laughs> um, but uh, what are some of the lessons? Well, some of the lessons include uh, we have to plan for change and not growth. Um, we have to plan with the process that addresses past legacy. What they discovered in Youngstown was that when they pulled people together and tried to get them to envision a different future, that they couldn't, they couldn't really start that until people were allowed to vent. So the chapter describes the venting, and it talks about all the issues and the past wrongs and the injustices and how people felt about those. Um, and basically what the authors say is you have to go through that. You can't skip that. You have to let people say what they really feel about the circumstances that they're living in. And then you have to move them to a sense of shared vision. So once they get past that, as happened in Youngstown, then you can help them decide, OK, this is what we really want to see in terms of a smaller, better city. And of course, focus on assets as well. And then the last one, um, you have to look at the landscape. You have to rediscover. Think about the land differently. Uh, you have to think about it in a way that um, maybe goes back uh, to its roots and reminds me of John's book. Um, you go back to ideas that were fundamental to the fabric of that particular city. Um, find ways to reuse land, um, act, I love that word, expeditiously to get rid of liabilities quickly that you can't just let them linger. You guys have been really patient. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate June and Margie on their book. Uh, Margie mentioned one of the great thrills of being an author is to have the book done and you can talk about it. An even greater one is to be able to autograph books that people are buying. So after this, go out and buy their book. It's right outside. Um, I'd like to make uh, three, three comments on this whole situation. Uh, the first um, is by now, city governments in Detroit and all these post-industrial cities uh, city governments themselves are almost incapable of providing the leadership that we need to address these problems. It's not that um, city governments are willfully um, uh, resistant, it's simply that they're so broke at this point that there's not enough money to do very much. I know we have some city officials or former city officials here from Detroit who have spent many, many hours, months, years devoted to the city of Detroit, um, and there, there are dedicated public servants in all these cities um, but the fact is, there's just no money left in the till. If you look at the property tax base uh, in all of these cities, so much of it has been moved to the suburbs that there's just not enough left to fund municipal services by city government as we would expect that to happen. 
even just in Tri-County Detroit, Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb, Detroit, more than 90% of the tax base is now in suburbia. Less than 10% is in the city of Detroit. So there's clearly just not enough to fund uh, municipal services as we would like to see them. And now the city over the years has gone to heroic measures to try to adjust to this. In 1970 or so, there were about 30,000 municipal employees at the city of Detroit. Now there's probably 10,000, that number goes down all the time. Uh, we have that, and I live in the city of Detroit, we have the highest property tax rates in the state, the highest city income tax rates in the state. We, have a, we are absolutely dependent on the casino tax money that comes in. Uh, we have special fees for a garbage pickup and that sort of thing. And the city borrows very, very heavily, and we still can't pay the bills, and the city's still on the brink of bankruptcy, and um, uh, you know, there's problems with street lights, a huge number of street lights don't work, and the, the fire stations are not staffed adequately, and, and all these things. And this is mirrored by what happens uh, to a greater or lesser extent in, in all the cities, uh, New Orleans, Cleveland, Buffalo, the smaller cities like Camden and Flint and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So, um, so municipal government is not going to provide uh, the answer, and we do have a question of what should municipal government be doing then? What is its core responsibility? Is it simply public safety, uh, or does it go beyond that? And we're sort of debating that right now. Um, now, second, the second point is that even as the capacity of municipal governments to deal with these problems has gone down, other groups have stepped up and increased their capacity to deal with these issues. And so I think the leadership on this whole you know, reimagining what cities should be comes from three areas. The foundation community, the university, and the neighborhood groups, the CDCs, the Community Development Corps. Uh, the foundation communities like Kresge, but also Community Foundation and so on, uh, you know, Mott, Ford, uh, Knight Foundation, are not only writing bigger checks, which they are, but they're also involving their people in day-to-day -day decisions um, in this whole question of reinventing cities. So that at the Detroit Future City planning process, which was just published their report, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> not only did Kresge and the other foundations write big checks to fund that, but they also had their people in there on a day-to-day -day basis working on, working on this stuff. Um, if you look at the community groups, <coughs> uh, take someone like Sue Mosey, who runs the universe, the, I'm sorry, Midtown Detroit, Inc., with the successor to the old University Cultural Center Association. When Sue joined that organization 25 years ago, there were perhaps one or two paid employees. Today she's got a staff of 20 to 25 paid employees, and they do all kinds of things. Originally, all they did is, is sort of do marketing, district marketing. Now they do real estate development. They're responsible for a lot of the real estate. They put together the deals that go happen in the neighborhood. Uh, they do a certain amount of code enforcement, mainly by uh, moral suasion, to try to get people to live up to what they should be doing. Uh, they do grant writing. Um, <clears throat> they, they manage all these grants that come in from <coughs> various organizations to help, help the city. The, uh, yeah, thank you. The, the, uh, uh, the, the Live Midtown, thank you. Um, the Live Midtown incentive program that's managed by, by Sue Mosey's group. And if you look at the other groups in the city, the Warren Connor Development Coalition, Southwest Detroit Business Association, um, they're all doing this, this kind of work, all capacity building. They've all staffed up enormously. They have uh, a lot more financial res resources, uh, much greater skill sets, and they're all taking over what amounts to um, uh, municipal governance by, by another name. One of the chapters in the books talks about the difference, maybe it's Dale's, I'm not sure, but the difference between governing and governance. And governing implies that it's happening through city government itself. And governance implies that there's this much more messy process where all kinds of groups are involved in providing uh, leadership. Um, and that's what we're seeing in Detroit and other cities. Um, this was really brought home to me when I visited Cleveland uh, and I spoke with the people at uh, Cleveland Circle Inc., Inc. which is the, um, the CDC that manages the area that, that's the equivalent of the Midtown area in Detroit. And as the director drove me around, he pointed out that the city streets, which are the responsibility of the city of Cleveland, were pitted and rutted and potholed and all that, but everything beyond the curbs, which was the responsibility of, of his group, were pristine because they had their own funding source from the universities and cultural centers. 
and the signage, the, the lawns, everything, everything looked great. And so you have a sort of a dysfunctional city, but a very, very uh, professional and up-to-date community group that's really, um, um, you know, taking, taking care of the public realm. We've also done this in a different way in Detroit. We, we've taken chunks of city government away and sent them either upstream to regional groups or downstream to single-purpose neighborhood groups. So, for example, region, uh, transit, which has been dysfunctional in Detroit for, for many, for decades, is, is about to be sent upstream to a regional transit authority, which is now in the process of being formed. Um, and things like the Cobo Convention Center, which was sent to a, a nonprofit authority in 2009, and Eastern Market, which went to its own authority in 2006, um, and uh, the Riverwalk and Campus Marshes are being built by private quasi-public conservancies. Uh, all these things are happening and, and doing really, really well uh, because we got them sort of away from municipal government and into the hands of people who could handle them. These have, every one of these has been controversial and we often go through these, these terrible debates at city council like we're having right now with Belle Isle uh, where, where people fight tooth and nail to hang on to the jewels. But in fact, once they move to the new entity, uh, things seem to work really, really well. And in fact, Eastern Market and Cobo have turned around completely, light years ahead of where they were just a few years ago. So the third, uh, so so we we are reinventing governance um, in in the face of this this absolute inability of city governments in so many other cities um, to you know to do anything because they just lack the wherewithal uh, at this point. And then the third point is that the Defe Detroit Future City Plan, which just came out two weeks ago a really massive report, 350 pages and so on, um, is really a wonderful document. And um, it's going to take a while for people to absorb it and digest it. Uh, but it really takes the best thinking in, um, in sort of urban planning circles and in reinventing cities plan, uh, thinking out there and applies them to Detroit in a very thoughtful way. So I think that in years to come, it will be at least as significant as the Youngstown 2010 plan is. And I'd like to see someone um, uh, running for mayor really take that on and say this is my this is my campaign document right here So those are my three observations and now I guess June and Margie and I are going to sit up here Do some questions. Thank you for the water by the way It was touched upon but skirted around and that is that these cities all exist in regions and these cities have limitations in the sense that the political structures are bounded by physical boundaries and yet as was pointed out you know if 80 if 90 percent of the tax base is in the region but not in the city um solutions that don't deal with the regional aspect of any of these cities is critical the second is that a lot of what i'm hearing is uh, market reliance um it's talking about market failures or or programs to work through markets and those have I mean, there's a whole body of literature that speaks to the problems of that, um, not the least of which in a city like Detroit, which, you know, it's 138 square miles and it's got a, a third of the population it had a long time ago, so that, you know, getting market-generated solutions. Um, and then the, th the third dimension that seemed to be missing is the, the, the degree to which or role of citizen input in terms of some of these plans and programs, those people who are around Detroit know that there is, uh, if nothing else, that, that whole more than kerfuffle around relocating people to form concentration. Uh, people felt isolated or left out of the discussion. And there is sort of a, a, a wisdom <coughs> that you don't ask the homeless where to build low-income housing, and they're the ones most affected. So I think those three things um, are missing, at least from the presentation. It may well be in the other articles. but. I think that they're critical constraints as we start envisioning or visioning a city, uh, even as it embraces its smallness, if you will. So those are questions slash comments. I think the book does address them more than we did, but um, your mic's not on. Apparently, it's it is. It's for the audio for the video. So I'll try to speak loudly enough for you to hear me and just wave if you can't. Um, so indeed, as John said, the regional solutions are vital. I, we agree. Um, they, 
um, issues that, and, we, and we've been able to see, see, though we didn't articulate, we did not go into this in detail in the book, but the, the real um, struggle that goes on as, it, as efforts to bring some of that money back to the city happen, they mean uh, changing who's in control, and that's not um, easy. And indeed, I would say um, the, the residents of the city shouldn't lose all say in what's going on in, in, the, in this transfers of money, essentially, where the state takes over something and does a good job of, say, demolishing uh, structures near schools, but um, people still have lot, that's not their elected officials now doing that. And um, on market failures, I think we did deal with that in, in the book. Indeed, Dale's chapter is really about how do you intervene to um, take advantage of market failures to strengthen places. Um, and the third one was citizen input. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, so I don't think really that we did, we don't have a chapter that talks about citizen input, but I think that's kind of assumed. Um, the, the way it, it comes through indirectly is at one point, it could, we thought that community development corporations would um, be a reflection of that input because those are uh, community-based organizations. So when we were talking about CDCs, we were really talking about these groups that at one point were supposed to be the representation of citizen input. Of course, what has happened is that quite often they're not. Um, so that is still an issue. Um, but no, but certainly I think that this is something, I think that was the lesson of the last chapter in terms of what, are, what do we need to know in terms of Youngstown and Cleveland about how we move forward, the whole idea of involving citizens in that discussion, I think was, was handled very well there, so. Yeah, just a comment, you're absolutely correct that the lack of regional reach is the big problem here. Southwestern cities handle this through annexation. They were allowed to grow after World War II. In 1950, Detroit was 139 square miles, today it's 139 square miles. Phoenix was 17 square miles, now it's 500 some. And that's Dallas, Houston, Albuquerque. They all they all grew that way. Um, so so that is a problem that the older cities were not allowed to expand in that way. European cities, of course, are much more regionally focused. As as one uh, German planner said one time to me, uh, we try to make people feel really stupid if they move out of town. You know, we want people to live in the city. Uh, so it, it's the sort of the lack of regional reach in all these sort of northeast Rust Belt mid Midwest cities that ultimately creates the problem that we're dealing with. And all the solutions that we try to reach, which tend to be, reach for, tend to be fragmentary because we're not dealing, we're not reaching for regional solutions except in a very minor way, like a regional board for Cobo or a regional transit authority, so. Yes? Um, I, I have a question, yes. John, maybe you're the first one to respond. I thank you for the panel. It's great to see the intelligent people Academic really care Detroit. I was there, I was always going to cry. You say the garlic is trash. The community really wants to wake up, but somehow it doesn't work. Um, I, in your book, you mentioned about the The history will repeat. No one mentioned about how San Francisco recovered because one man played very important role. His name is A. P. Chiannini. That's why Bank of America created. He initiated micro loan that time, right after earthquake and the Great Depression. That is city compared with Detroit. Right now we have three important people. You talk about the Dan Gilbert. You talk about Manny Romney. You talk about another person, Pensky. 
those are the important figures. Then we have CDCs. I see trash, not garlic, wheat. But meantime, I see some risk takers. My question as a panel is that, who are really important movers and shakers we rely on? Before we talk too much detail, there's a golden bridge, golden gate bridge. There's another bridge was dominated by one man, but was defeated by the people. We're going to build a new bridge, but it's still fighting going on. How we can solve the problem, say, instead, what, what, what? But who are the movers and shakers? Or we have class of creativities. <coughs> Well, I, I think if Maddie Maroon is the one of the three, we're in trouble. <laughs> I and I'm sorry to speak in that way, but I think, you know, basically his concern is the Ambassador Bridge and his own company and I don't see that that really is a but Dan Gilbert is another another person. Um, I think what he's doing in terms of buying up I think is now thirteen buildings downtown. <coughs> 15 is very interesting, and, and we'll see. You know, we're still watching. The story is still evolving, so we'll see what happens. Um, I think the movers and shakers in terms of, of Detroit are different. The, the way those of you in political science or policy would think of this in terms of regime theory, we've had a very weak regime in Detroit. So you would think that a city such as Detroit that had the auto industry, you would have seen a very strong growth coalition that, that was consistent over 50, 100 years. Whereas in Detroit, the auto headquarters were either not in the center of the city or leaving as fast as they could. So Henry Ford developed Dearborn instead of Detroit. So there's been a, a long, long history of disinvestment. So I think we can't depend, we have not been able to depend in Detroit on this, uh, on what you think of in other places as the movers and shakers, a, um, AKA a growth coalition or regime. They just have not been consistent. But of course we've had people, uh, there are people, um, uh, Illich is one that I would name, um, who are doing interesting things and we wait and see. Some people think that um, Dan Gilbert is crazy like a fox. I mean, he's buying very cheap buildings, and so he's going to make a profit. Um, I think the real anchors um, have been the institutions that, you know, basically it's a medical center, um, it's Wayne State University, um, and of course, the nice thing about this Detroit City Future Plan is we see there's some other anchors at other places, but we're still watching to see how this evolves. And I would add that um, the remarkable, there are so many remarkable people in the city doing so many interesting things who aren't the people whose names we would necessarily hear. They are the leaders of community-based organizations who've been often working 30 years on these issues. And um, they are um, working against considerable odds, but, um, and, and making a considerable difference. And I really believe that in Detroit, there is not one answer, one big answer to the big problem. It's going to be many, many answers from many, many people that, that relieve the problems of the city. Um, let's see. Yes? Um, in your presentation, you had mentioned about sustainability and how that is part of like, what a city should become. And it was cool to see that it was all aspects of sustainability, not just environment, but economics, society. Oh. Um, so my question is, um, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more about how that plays a role in developing a city, and maybe also if there was anything that you learned specifically towards like alternative energy and how that might play a role in developing a city. Uh, well, we're, we're talking about uh, doing a lot of these things right now, mostly talking. Most of them haven't happened yet. Things like the blue infrastructure that the Detroit Future City Plan talks about, that we would create these artificial ponds and lakes and swales and so on uh, to give rainwater someplace to go besides the sewer system. 
so we don't have to spend <clears throat> millions of dollars a year, you know, running rainwater through our sewer system. Um, and you know, green far carbon forests, um, planting trees along highways and around uh, factories to soak up air pollution to lower the rates of asthma and respiratory disease, and um, you know, as well as urban farming, so we can feed ourselves more. And I guess the question I have is, is what's going to work? I mean, not one question is to what extent are we going to commit to that? To what extent are we going to see that that's important in getting all these disparate groups like Detroit Public Schools and Water and Sewer and all the others? to buy into it, and that once you do it, will we do it to the point that it makes a difference? Will we just plant a few trees here and there, or will we really you know, go into <coughs> the whole concept of carbon forests, and, and then will it actually lower rates of asthma and respiratory diseases? So how much good will all this do? And we're, you know, the exciting thing for me is that right now we're at, at the front end of that in deciding, yeah, we think this is a good idea. OK, how do we design it? How do we implement it? Who's in charge? You know, how do we pay for it? How long does it take it then? How much good does it do? So that's where we are right now. So. Yes. Yes. Thanks. I think John mentioned that you saw the university as one of these sort of triad and the new leadership. Um, and I wonder if you could elaborate on this a little bit. Um, lessons learned, key directions, well, mistakes think, made. How, how do you see the university? Well, I think mainly as a thought leader. Uh, you know, so a lot of the great interviews I've done have been with university researchers who, who had the luxury, unlike newspaper reporters, of really taking a topic and digging into it in really depth. Um, and so, uh, you know, Gail, for example, and Gail Thompson over here, uh, and I have had conversations about targeting, which have been very, very helpful. So I think as thought leaders, the university people are very important. And then they're in there in the fight. When I said, you know, Kresge has opened an office in Detroit, well, so has U of M. And, and uh, I see Eric working here from the U of M office uh, in Detroit. And all the universities, Lawrence Tech and UD Mercy. UD Mercy was a big part of the Detroit Future City planning effort. So, you know, they're, they're not out here sort of just, to, you know, in the tower, you know, spinning theories, but they're in there sort of getting their hands dirty on the ground, looking at all these topics. You know, how do you plan for a city after abandonment? So I, I think, that, you know, I, I repeat, that's one of the triad of leadership that we're getting in, in the city, city now. Um. Hi, thanks so much for this. Um, I wanted to speak to this idea that you put out um, of change without growth, or the idea that you know this acceptance that growth isn't going to happen, which is something that I think a lot of us can get behind as an idea. But I think that one of the um, one of the challenges of that, and something that people might push back against, is to say, yes, but this is a city where we have a very large poor population, um, lo lo really high unemployment. And so I was wondering if you could speak to the issue of how we can provide for people um, if we accept an idea that there won't be economic growth. Uh, we didn't, I don't think we meant to accept that there won't be economic growth. There really has to be some um, growth in jobs or, and access to jobs and um, improvements in education to enable people to <coughs> find better jobs and so forth. And that's really, really important because the um, city has lost so m it really has lost well over 90% of its manufacturing jobs and its retail jobs. There's very few jobs left in the city in relation to the population. It does not have its share of regional jobs at all. And so, and Detroit Future, I think, said 40% of, 30% of um, people who live in Detroit actually work in Detroit. So that's really, that's really important. It also, but it doesn't mean you, you uh, go after um, a big subsidy for a plant. It doesn't mean you um, put a huge amount of your community development block grant dollars into an, um, a, a new company or something. It really means that um, you, think about how can people be connected with jobs that exist and how can more jobs be created in many small ways. Yes. Should I use the microphone? There it is. Hi, I am. 
I do a lot of work in the spatial epidemiology of violence and such, mostly in Flint. Um, I have a kind of spatial sensibility that I bring to these things. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking, uh, what I wanted to also ask you guys about, because I see we work closely in Flint. We have a, CD, a Center for Disease Control Youth Violence Prevention Grant. And that place is, uh, it's as if a meteor strike had hit, right? I mean, you know, the, the GM plant was lifted out, and economically that place was essentially shot in the head. Um, so that's, that's what happened to Europe after World War II, and there was the Marshall Plan. It was a very large-scale thing. There's, Flint is emblematic, as is Detroit, maybe others, but my, my question is, like, there's local, there's regional, then there's national level efforts that need to be brought to bear here, right? And if we're not speaking at the national level for the Rust Belt cities, for these essentially these abandoned places, I'm from, the, I'm from California, we have lots of ghost towns, they're smaller. But are these effectively going to become ghost towns? I mean, you know, like we tried it here, it didn't work, everyone needs to leave now. Um, similarly, in, I'm doing multi-city comparisons of crime and such. New Orleans, as soon as people could, they left. One of the dirty secrets about that is there's a lot of really poor people there who needed to leave and they couldn't until the FEMA funds came through as badly uh, distributed and all the other issues um, that occurred there. Is that something that we have to start thinking a little more proactively about? I'm, 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 I'm just brainstorming, I don't have an answer, but. This is a truly epic, large-scale, systemic issue, and I wanted to bring that. It's almost like climate change, S seriously. Anyway, thank you. Um, well, I, I think it's important to speak to the national level. I think um, for this particular book, we tended to focus more on the local level and the state level. Um, I think if I personally had more faith that our voice could be heard at the national level, I would address that, but it seems as if these cities have been ad abandoned um, by national government. Um, but I, I do think that what we should look at is maybe, um, and I can perfectly relate to what you're saying about Flint, and we have the same feeling about much of Detroit. But what's interesting is that as we start studying these neighborhoods and smaller chunks of the city, we're seeing uh, forms of life and uh, res resilience that um, are not commonly known. And I'm thinking, for example, this neighborhood Brightmoor, <coughs> which we've sent several students to, we've studied um, in some depth, I mapped it in one of the maps, um, is pretty much bombed out in some ways. The center of it is bombed out. And yet it has a fairly high number of home-based um, businesses. They are not big. They're not a replacement for GM, but they're there. People seem to have taken over some of the economic development for themselves. Um, their, uh, Margie, some of Margie's research has shown that what people are doing sometimes with this vacant land is creative stuff. I mean, essentially reusing it to create homesteads um, instead of their uh, formerly narrow lots. Uh, this Brightmoor area, as far as we can tell, is the one in Detroit with the densest level of community organizations. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has like 38 or 40 in the Brightmoor Alliance. So I think um, one of the things that, that the research has shown me is that we <coughs> can't necessarily generalize about um, what we see as decay and decline from the um, mega perspective. When you look on the ground, sometimes people are making amazing adjustments. Now that's not to say that they should be doing, that we should let that stand, that, that we should depend on that. Um, there are still things that we should do as a society. We shouldn't make people depend on those kinds of things like hairdressing in their, in their kitchen or something like that. But let's at least acknowledge that some of that exists. That's my. Sure. Um, in terms of the, are these cities going to disappear? The, all these cities occupy really strategic points. Obviously, New Orleans, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and those those will still be there. That their reason for being will still be there. Uh, you know, past the current thing, and so I, you know, even before the auto industry, Detroit had 300,000 people. So, so they're, they're, these cities will still be here. What they become, of course, is the question. In terms of um, 
uh, spatial uh, aspects of violence. There's a paper that came out a year or two ago in Philadelphia about the Philadelphia green vacant lot r r gun violence. You know that one, I guess. Okay, good. I think it is striking that the, in the presidential election there was no mention of an urban policy really and it's um, so indeed it's getting no this uh, these cities are getting little to no attention um, and also what people from who go to these meetings say the meetings in HUD for instance say is that they're uh, the HUD officials are really still talking to grow growing cities and the um, areas of growing cities that need some support and not thinking about what about the cities where there isn't going to be uh, prospects for there aren't prospects for new development. Um, this is a question about how we represent Detroit. So it seems to me that there are two stories that people often tell about Detroit that map on to sort of a longer trajectory in thinking about industrial cities. And one is Detroit as a warning of sorts, so the, the Detroit that's been effectively eviscerated, shot in the head, however you want to put it. And then on the other hand, the sort of inspiring, hopeful, this sort of urban gardening and community redevelopment kind of story. And I guess the question, uh, in in one way, this is just an invitation to sort of have you guys reflect on that, but then also to ask, um, how long has it sort of been torn between those two poles in Detroit, right? Like, how long have those two stories been active? And then um, it seems to me, and maybe this just demonstrates my own sort of familiarity with Detroit more than anything else, but that the inspiring story has become more and more sort of active in popular media accounts and, and how people think about Detroit. And I just sort of wanted to ask, like, why now, if that's true? Um, well, I think in the last few years, these these two story. I mean, the, the the depressing story about Detroit's over, it's done, it's dead. That's been around for a long time. The more hopeful story is uh, been emerging for maybe about ten years or less, um, and I think it tracks some of the uh, efforts that have been emerging. Uh, most of the community gardens in Detroit are less than 10 years old. Most are less than five years old. Uh, Earthworks, for example, probably the, the best one, is only about 10 or 12 years old. So, the, so one reason is that the media is looking at what's been happening. Um, you know, the big celebration of downtown Detroit since Dan Gilbert moved down. Dan Gilbert moved down two years ago. So, so a lot of interesting stuff is happening, and we're covering that. I think there's also, even though people say the media is always looking for bad news. The media is desperate to report good news. <laughs> Let me tell you, people would much rather buy a paper with good news than bad news in it. So, um, so uh, I, I think the interplay of these two things is really interesting. It's hard to get someone to give you both in a measured way. You either get you know, stuff like the rune porn, uh, Detroit Disassembled, that photo book by Andrew Moore, or you get something completely optimistic and, and almost Pollyannish. And it, it's tough to get sort of a a good measured where are we sort of thing. Uh, Detroit Future City actually does that pretty well. I think it, it, it's, it's honest about the problems, but also looks ahead toward possible solutions. <coughs> So I live in Detroit off of Grand River and 96, and I own a house there. And when I, I see the, the big plan of D, the Detroit Works project come out, and I look at my surroundings and I look at where they're mapping out certain things, and I'm going, whoa, that, that'd be really different if that was actually put in place. Um, and now I've looked at the plan as in depth as I need to. Um, but I'm just wondering, as a as a citizen living in an area where, according to the plan, my house maybe shouldn't be there, or um, as an urban planner that is out that is truly truly want wants the best for the public, how do I engage with the with the larger plan? How do I engage with the city? Uh, how do I be a citizen there? Um, and, and 
do that responsibly and work with the government, not against, but also do my part. And so the planners for Detroit Future City say, I've heard them say this several times, we were looking at this from 30,000 to 50,000 feet up. And a lot of the areas where they've said, here's the future for this area are um, actually very diverse. They shouldn't be all the same in the future. And so there's a lot of work to do to get down to the ground on what should happen. And in the, do you know about the LEAP plan, the Lower East Side Action Plan? They have actually done a lot to look in a very fine-grained way about what could the future of their area be. And their plan differs from Detroit Future City in that Detroit Future City is looking at kind of very big pieces of prop big pieces of the city and um, LEAP is looking at a few blocks here and a few blocks there and, and um, the city officials have said they are supportive of LEAP. Now all that you know has to be followed and monitored and you'll need to keep track of what's happening in your neighborhood but I think people are open to listening to different scenarios. Yeah, and also, of course, Detroit Future City is not a formally adopted no. plan anyway. I mean, it's a framework. It's a strategic framework. And um, the history of planning in Detroit is that some stuff gets put out there that's adopted, and some stuff never does. So um, I don't think you should sell your house tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone.